Hi, if Gustavo could join me on the stage. Ah, okay. Hello. Hi, Gustavo. Right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Gamifiers meetup. Um, <clears throat> feel free to ask questions, put questions in the chat or the Q&A throughout this interview with Gustavo. I've got a few questions for him, um, but I'm sure there'll be time for some questions from you as well. So why don't I just start by saying I'm Pete Jenkins. I run Gamification Plus, and I've organized this Gamifiers meetup. I'm trying to run one a month where I interview either a gamification author or a researcher such as Gustavo. Do you count as an author with all these publications to your name? Probably. <laughs> it's just not a book. I, I don't know. Good question. It's a good question, isn't it? Hey, look, yeah. I first got to know Gustavo when we were on the committee running GAMFED, the International Gamification Confederation, together. And he was always keen to support the gamification industry and the quality of the work and the research that's being done around gamification. Um, also, I quite often quote Andrzej Marzuski's work on user type hexad things. And one of the reasons I've got the confidence to do that is because of the research that Gustavo has been involved in around this topic. So I'm really pleased to have you here today with us, Gustavo. Great. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. My pleasure. But uh, how would you describe yourself? So, as you said, in the gamification world, I am first a researcher, I guess. I have been working with gamification research for the past five years. Started with a PhD that is now finished. And I focused on how to design personalized game for solutions during this time. And now I continue doing research, but I have also expanded now that the PT is finished, I have also expanded by creating a company with my former PhD supervisor. And now we work on also some consulting, helping people design game for solutions and education by helping people learn how to do that. Well, let's give it a plug. What's the company called? It's called MotiveUX. So you can check us out at motivux.com if you want to know more about us super i'm sure we can share a link in the chat later as well um yeah. are you still average are you still actively involved in gamfed i'm not in the board anymore i was i didn't have time anymore with so many projects going on uh, i had to leave the board but um, i'm still a member and a supporter of gamefed for sure that's cool um, I know what I was going to ask. How did you actually get into gamification in the first place? What caught your interest? So, well, like many people who got interested in gamification, I have been playing games for a long time. And so around 2014, 2015, um, the gamification industry and research was starting to bloom, right? And then while looking for topics for my PhD, I came in contact with some books and online articles explaining that you could use ideas from games to actually make lots of things that are not games more enjoying, more successful, more engaging. And that seemed like a great idea. So I decided to study how to do that and to make a contribution um, to the industry as well. That's fantastic. Now, obviously, we need to know what sort of games do you play? Uh, I guess I mostly play uh, role-playing games. Um, I've been a long fan of the Final Fantasy series. <laughs> and I've also been play, playing the Civilization series uh, since the first one. I, I've played the first one a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so what type of games do you enjoy most then? The, the sort of RPGs or the strategy? What are we... Yeah, I guess, I guess RPG are the types that I enjoy the most. Uh, but, you know, I've played other types and enjoy them as well. Strategy, uh, platform games, <laughs> many others. Mm -hmm. I guess RPG is where I always come back to and play, spend more time playing. That's cool. How much do you uh, draw upon your experiences in these games, in your work and your research? Yeah. Uh, 
a lot of course because uh, when you play the games you have the you live the experience yourself so you can feel what works and doesn't work for you and of course you have to be careful when you generalize because things that work for you might not work exactly the same for everybody so everybody is different but you get a lot of this feeling of about making things engaging and then you get a lot uh, of opportunities to think about that and think about how you could apply that to other situations right? so when i think about applying some gamification to educational applications for example i it's not just okay let's add some points here and <laughs> you have the opportunity to actually think about okay let's go back and see what makes me have fun when playing games not just having points there's lots of things that are involved in that so that's what I try to draw upon, what makes the experience enjoyable so I can replicate that experience in my work. I think that's a really good way to do it, I have to say. Hey, look, for all my previous interviews in this series, I interviewed gamification authors, and I would uh, always read or reread the book before the interview. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. time I thought, hey, Gustavo has not published a book, he's just published a few papers. This will be really easy this time. And then... <laughs> And then I went through and looked at all your publications. I lost count at 40 articles, publications, etc. You're quite prolific, aren't you? <laughs> I think I'd like to, through the interview, I'd like to take us on a sort of chronological journey through some of your work and see where we end up. I mean, I can see an underlying theme in your research, and we'll see if anyone else can spot it. Um, but let's start in 2015. You wrote a couple of papers that caught my attention. One on personalized, playful digital wellness assistant. Yeah. And another where you started looking at the gamification hexad user types questionnaire. Now, did one of those lead to the other or were they just very separate? They were separate. Like the digital wellness assistant was my initial idea for a PhD topic when I came to Canada to start working. But about the same time, then when I was starting to read a lot about the uh, what the other gamification authors had published, I came in contact with Andre's work on the Hexad. And about the same time, he was posting some tweets uh, saying that he was looking for researchers to help him validate the Hexad scientific uh, methods. And so I got back to him and we started working together with him and at that moment, some researchers from Austria as well, in the first round of creating the new scale and validating it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, <laughs> at that moment, and I started shifting my attention more to how to design personalized solutions and the idea of the wellness assistant ended up not happening because I spent a lot of time then thinking about user types, player traits and personalized design. Yeah, that makes sense. And the next year, you published more work on the Hexad as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, in, yeah, that initial paper in 2015 was just kind of a work in progress. We were just starting the work. And in 2016 is when we actually published the scale that we have been using until today with the initial validation. Yeah, I think it was um, one of the most useful things for the industry was to have and Jay's work um, looked at academically so that we can actually start working with it and uh, yeah. generating mm -hmm. results and things. Yeah, I'm very glad that we could help with that. So I think it's a very useful model for everybody, for researchers, for the industry. Yeah. Also that year, you published a paper on your heuristic evaluation for gameful design. Yeah. Um, can you give us a bit of an insight into how you came up with this and where you've been using it since. And I know there's a follow-up paper a couple of years later as well. Yeah, that came out of uh, necessity that we felt because we were working, uh, not just me, but uh, other researchers at our HCI Games Group as well, which is our lab with uh, the University of Waterloo. So we have been, we had been doing this game for designs to apply to a lot of different applications but then we started asking ourselves, okay, how do we evaluate if what we're doing is really working, right? And mm -hmm. of course, the final evaluation is always a user study where you ask people to actually interact with your system and give you feedback. But we wanted to do something before reaching that stage because 
you know, you should be able to first do an initial evaluation that is quicker and cheaper. So you have a good idea that you are going to the right direction. So when you go to the user study, which takes more time and is more expensive, you already have a system that has received a bit of polishing. And at that moment, we didn't find any tool that could help us do that. So we thought, well, okay, let's create one. So, <laughs> and that was a very interesting project that I didn't do alone. Well, like most of the projects uh, yeah. that, I, that I published, there was always a great team of the HCI Games Group and the Games Institute at the University of Waterloo working together. Um, so we reviewed all the game for design methods that we found at the moment. Um, and we derived then, okay, if they say that we need to design systems this way, so then we have to take, um, to create a method that we can use to evaluate if we did the design correctly. And that's where it came from. So now we can use that uh, set of heuristics as kind of a checklist. As soon as we have our first design ideas to see if we forgot anything and we can go back to the design table and just iterate and improve that um, until we are satisfied that at least in this initial evaluation, we're happy with the result before we go to the user tests. I have been using that in almost all my gamification projects since then, because it just, it's a very useful uh, way for me to do the initial feedback. Okay, I designed an initial set of ideas here. So what the heuristics do for me is they help me check if I remember to consider all the different motivational uh, aspects, or if I forget, if I forgot uh, something. So I always yeah. use it as a checklist and in our consulting projects as well, it has been useful to help us evaluate the applications that people uh, show us and give them feedback about what they can improve. It's been very useful to me. That's cool. I mean, can you highlight to us how it works? You know, what do you actually measure? Sure, it uh, uh, works by letting you check if your application has, uh, has covered all the different types of motivations. So it has 12 categories like competence, mastery, autonomy, relatedness, um, ownership. Uh, and so you see, these are all different types of uh, motivations that we need to um, work with that you will find in the whole gamification literature, people saying that you need to <laughs> make people feel competent, you need to make people feel autonomous, things like that. And so the heuristics have some guiding questions to help you check if you've done that. So it has questions like for competence, for example, are you giving enough feedback about what people just did right? Are you suggesting what are the next best actions that they can do so they can continue uh, their steps toward mastery. So you can quickly just go through those questions and think about it. And if your design is not taking care of one of those uh, questions yet, it means that probably there is an opportunity for you to think a little bit more and add a bit more elements to your system so you can take care of that. That's good. So it's it's quite a high level check. Whereas I know some of the other checks out there, like Ganjo's application analysis, are a bit more specific to like, does it include these certain game elements? So it's assuming they're being used for the purposes you're describing, like competence, but maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Instead of focusing on the elements, we focus on the motivational aspects because you can use different elements for the same types of motivations. Yeah. Uh, is there... Anything that nearly always crops up as missing when you run the yeah. run the, the analysis? Sorry? So um, quite often when I look at gamification projects that come to us yeah. that people are already working on, there's, there's normally right. like a key area that's missing. Right? In my experience, it's, it's nearly always any aspect of social. They've designed yeah. an individual's game and not really gone to any effort in terms of teams yeah. or yeah. guilds yeah. or gluing people together somehow. But what's your experience of using the tool and seeing what's missing? Is there anything that stands out yeah. that gets missed a lot? Yeah, uh, I agree the social aspect, uh, unless it's something that has been uh, taught since the start is often something that is missing. But even 
for the other aspects, um, like people easily think about rewards, but implication is much more than just rewards, right? Mm -hmm. So even in the other aspects, for example, if you think about competence and mastery, games are very good in always telling you what you have to do next, for example, it's something simple, but you're never lost in the game. You're always excited because you have something new, exciting to do. Um, yeah. And that's something that I see a lot of uh, applications missing, you know, they use just complete something and then they have a screen with lots of options and okay, what do I do now? That's not engaging. Uh, so a lot of applications miss that, just guide the user, let them know what else they can do. Do you know what? I think that's exactly the feedback I gave yeah. to the last client who showed me what they've been working on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm looking at this, I'm like, what on earth are you supposed to do next? There's all these different yeah. options. Yeah. That's very good. There's a comment in the chat about, can you share the paper on Gameful Heuristics? And I'm going to give you a top tip here. Go to Gustavo's website, Gameful Bits. Is it GamefulBits.com? Yeah. Yeah, because there's a great page on A, what he's researching, and B, on these publications. Yeah, if you go to the publications menu option in the site, you will find them all there. Yeah. And, of course, he's got some really easy-to-read articles. You can see. Yeah. So you don't always have to go into the depth of a I also put here... Right. Yeah, I also put here hcigames.com, which is uh, the, my research lab at the University of Waterloo. And on my website, you'll find all my papers, but on hcigames.com, you'll find my papers and others as well, because they've done a lot of interesting things as well. They certainly have. I might get to some of those that you've been involved in as well. Uh, thanks for that bit. Going back to my chronological journey through your research, Okay. The next year, which if I, uh, yeah, 2017, saw your research diverge slightly, I'd say, into video game playing preferences. And you put together a framework and a taxonomy. And then we saw a paper on elements of gameful design emerging from user preferences. So it sounds to me like you were thinking more about players and video games at this point than gamification. Is that right? Yes, partly. So I'll, I'll explain it. <laughs> so um, my main project was to focus on gamification. And that's where this paper on elements of gameful design came up. Um, for that paper, my thought was that we were using user types, which are very interesting to understand different styles of interactions with uh, game for applications. But we were trying to also use them as an indirect measure of the type of elements that people prefer. So mm -hmm. we kind of, we ask a person about the user types and then from the user types, we try to guess what game elements they prefer. So that's, there's this two step process. And I thought, why don't we just do a one step process where we ask people directly what game elements they prefer? So in that paper, I specifically asked people about gamification, not games, but I listed a bunch of game elements and, and asked them, how much do you like these game elements when they are used in game applications? And then I can, that resulted into a classification of gameful design elements in groups according to user preferences. So that's, uh, that's, me is very interesting to help with design because we have other classifications of elements that focus on similarity or, or structural uh, characteristics. These elements are built similarly to these others, and that's useful as well. But our classification focuses on user preferences. Right? So it means that if there are 10 elements in a group, it means that if a user likes one element of that group, probably they also like the other nine. So that might be very useful for uh, for design. Uh, yeah, I like that. I, I, for me, it felt like this was the start of a more practical line of yeah. applying your understanding of what players enjoy and then being able to use that in the design process. Yeah, exactly. And I have been using that in the design process very much. Uh, to me, actually, to help me design, that has been more useful than the user types. And 
don't get me wrong, I still love the user types to understand how people <laughs> uh, work in game for applications, right? It's still very useful as well. But for the specific design uh, task of selecting game elements, I have been using my classification more because it's just more direct classification, right? So what I do to design personalized game for application is, is usually, I know that I have to include there a few elements for each type of user. Mm -hmm. because if I only include elements that uh, focus on one type of user, I will have some users that will love my application and others that just won't care. So uh, I need to have different elements there so everybody finds something that they like. So that task is simply, I go to my list of design groups and I just select a few elements from each group that basically guarantees that I have a few elements for everybody. That's such an important step if you want to engage a bigger audience or all of a particular yeah. audience, isn't it? Because yeah. we all like different types of game. Exactly, yeah. Should I talk about the player types then? <laughs> Ooh, no, not yet. Not I'm going yet? to talk this now, actually, because I'm going chronologically. Okay. I'm going to go for in 2018. This, this yeah. for me, was quite an exciting year looking at your research, and I remember some of these things. But one of the papers I really liked and I still, I'm still pointing my students at it all the time, was actually your paper on uh, gamification as seen through the eyes of goal setting theory. Okay. And I like it because obviously everyone else was always just talking about self-determination theory or maybe a bit of Dan Pink's drive. Um, and yet this is another theory that really relates or correlates really well with games and what we experience in games. And one of the key things about it is we love the goals in games, missions, quests, all of that sort of thing as well. So I want to dig a bit deeper into this. And I think my question to you is, how important do you think goal setting theory should be in gamification work? Uh, very important. <laughs> very important. Because you know, having goals is one of the most defining characteristics of games. And it's quite a lot of discussions about that. <laughs> Some people also say that there are some games without goals. But you know, in my understanding, you can have things without goals that are very fun, but that's more on the playful side already, something that you play with, either that, that, that a game. Um, anyway, the fact is that most games have goals at their core. There are things that you need to do. And um, by doing them is how you progress in games, right? And yeah. Goal setting theory has decades of history investigating exactly how that works. And um, there is a basic general conclusion that goals lead to higher performance in whatever you're doing when they are uh, challenging enough, but not too challenging which is going to sound familiar for gamification designers because everybody talks about that as well. Yeah. Uh, and when people are committed to those goals, right? so you can directly translate that when you are designing gamification. I really think that we uh, need to be tapping into all that knowledge that exists already. There's lots of papers about goal setting theory, explaining how things work and exploring the details about that. So if you know of all of that, I'm sure you will be a better gamification designer because it's not just about setting any goals in your uh, game for system. You need to set them right. They need to have the uh, right level of difficulty uh, for your users. You need to encourage them to commit to those goals. And there are several other aspects of the theory that are useful as well. That's really good. I, I think it's really important as well. Which is why I wanted to bring it up, and I, and I thank you for adding that because it it sort of stands out from all the other work in terms of like oh I've gone off and had a look at something a bit different, and actually it was one of the most interesting papers I read that whole year. Okay, um, now from this point on in your researches, there's a lot more about personalizing gameful design, gameful systems. Why do you think personalized design is so important? Um, so as we've said before in this interview, people like different types of, types of games and have different preferences. Now, one reason I think that personalization is 
particularly interesting for gamification is that usually you create game for applications where you want to have everybody engaged. So with entertainment games, it's a bit different. Usually you choose an audience. And you don't create a game that tries to be enjoyable by everyone. Mm -hmm. As long as you have enough people buying your game, you're happy with it, even if there are other people that just don't enjoy uh, the style of your game, right? But usually when you're gamifying something, that cannot happen. Like if you're gamifying a classroom, for example, you don't want to create an experience that is very fun for half of your class and it's very boring for the other half because those students that see that as boring will suffer, right? So usually you need to create something that is enjoyable by everyone. And that's very hard when people like different things. How do you create something that is uh, just great for everybody? And one of the ways that you can do that is just you put a lot of different things there so mm -hmm. everybody can find something that they enjoy. But if you just have lots of different things, it can be overwhelming for the user. If you open an application, there are 50 different things that you have to do. So that can kill your motivation right there if you feel that it's too much. Um, so that's where I think that personalization comes and it's very important. I think that you need to design systems that have something for everybody, but you need to be able to uh, somehow highlight those activities that each person likes more and somehow tone down the other ones so they don't feel that it's something that they have to do if they enjoy less so they don't feel overwhelmed uh, just feeling that they have to do everything right um, that's cool so so it sounds to me like the earlier you get them in the game or the gamification and start personalizing however that might be done is really important to increase yeah. the enjoyment of it mm. yeah I like that. I, so, all right. So what are the key things you try for in that first stage personalizing journey in the design? So for now, what we have explored is just giving people some opportunity to customize their own experience. So even some simple things like letting people uh, have a list of what the design elements that are available in the system and just selecting, okay, I want to use this one, but not the other one. Uh, at least in our research that has been shown very interesting results. People really seem to enjoy that choice and, and feel that they are in control of their experience. And similar results have been shown in research by different uh, labs. Like I've seen those results and we have here in the audience, uh, Max Altmaier, which is from another research lab that has also done a lot of research on personalized gamification. And they also had similar results like that. When you give people some choice, they really appreciate the experience and the results are better. And of course, at some point in the future, I expect people to get to the point of using these recommended systems with artificial intelligence where you can log a lot of data uh, from millions of users and then using artificial intelligence you can figure out what the new user can like hopefully we'll get to that point in the future but uh, i haven't seen anybody reliably doing that yet and also that's very expensive to do and you need very large data sets so the artificial intelligence works properly but if you don't have all of that yet just by being able to give users some simple choices would just be better. It's getting, it's getting more doable, by the way. One, one of my clients, yeah. one of the people who's speaking on the health and wellness day at my conference in a couple of weeks, uses quite a lot of AI to tailor the experience in their gamified health app. Yeah, yeah. To do to do those sort of things, and that you know, obviously, once you've built the algorithms, it's just a case of fine tuning them for other situations. So yeah. I think that is, we need a bit of your approach because I think that's low budget, which is really important and a bit of technology when we yeah. hit scale it as well. different types of projects yeah yeah sometimes i think that even games would benefit from using my approach <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that i've seen for example this uh large multiplayer uh rpgs that i play a lot they have very different types of quests 
so that everybody can enjoy a little bit of everything, like I've said before. But sometimes it's hard to figure out what type of quests uh, something is before <laughs> you start, uh, unless you exit the game and you Google the name of the quest to figure out. And sometimes I find myself, you know, at this this point of the game, I'm enjoying doing these types of quests. I don't want to do these other types of quests. And sometimes I just click on a quest and I spend 10 minutes on to find out, oh, no, this is a type of quest that I don't want to do right now. Uh, so even being able to do what I said, just, okay, here's a list of types of quests, you know, just I want to select the types of quests that I want to do. And the other types just... Don't show them to me at this moment. Maybe in the future I want to do them, yeah. but not right now. That's and really the cool. kind of thing can be applied to gamification, I guess. I think so. I mean, that's what we do, isn't it? We, we steal the best bits yeah. from games, if possible, yep. and use them in our gamification. You mentioned Max a minute ago. I'm pretty sure I watched a talk from him at Kai Play last year. And actually, that reminded me, one of my favorite talks um, from last year's Kai Play was supposed to be delivered by you, but was actually delivered by Leonard Nack, eh? Yeah. Uh, who did it for you. Maybe he could swim further across the ocean. I can't remember why he couldn't make it. And, <laughs> and that talk was a lot of fun, but it opened my eyes to your work on player traits yeah. as opposed to the hex ad. Now, how important is, is it to use something like this to understand the players? Um, yeah. You know, for that talk, I was very excited to give it, but uh, I had some... Uh, unexpected personal issues, and I couldn't travel to Barcelona. It ended up being maybe even better because Leonard's just a fun presenter. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe he presented my paper better than I could. <laughs> differently. <But, laughs> differently, for sure. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that whole research about player traits ended up being something very interesting as well, as you said. It was not even my main research topic, but I got involved with it and it was just so good that I keep doing it. And this all came, uh, this all came from Leonard's previous work on the Brain X that he did when he was a PhD student several years ago together with Chris Bateman. Um, and they did a lot of work uh, on this initial idea of classifying types of players and they collected a lot of data and when i started working with leonard they just had that large data set sitting there and nobody was doing anything with it <laughs> so, <laughs> so i asked leonard okay if you have the data set nobody's using it can i analyze it and see what we can get from there and so we did it. We put together a research team with uh, other students as well, and Leonard, and we did an initial analysis. Unfortunately, what we found out is that the idea was very interesting, but the questionnaire that they created for the Brain X didn't work very well. I when remember you, him mentioning that in the talk. Yeah. yeah. When you run the statistical analysis, unfortunately, it didn't work very well. So the conclusion is that we needed to create new questions. Those questions were not working. Uh, and so we kept working on that. Um, but also, at the same time, we were all starting to uh, realize that trying to classify people into single types is not the best approach because people usually don't have just one preference. Uh, we have a complex set of preferences, and maybe they have a style of play that they enjoy a bit more, but they also have other things that they like. And so we moved away from this idea of types and more into the idea of traits. Yeah. So we can try to identify what are the fundamental uh, types of interactions that people enjoy. And then we create a profile for the person that says, okay, your enjoyment, you enjoy highly social and action uh, interactions. You don't enjoy uh, immersion that much, but then, you know, it's a complex profile. It's not just a single classification. Um, so we did a bunch more other papers trying to get to that point until we finally created a good player traits model that was heavily inspired by the work they did in BrainX and others. And we feel that now it works well. We tried uh, the new questions and they worked. And we had some feedback from some people in the industry that already tried to use our player traits. And it worked 
fine with some some of the things didn't work 100 but it's to be expected on a new model you always find new things and you start yeah. adjusting but um but in general they said that it, it seemed to work quite well so we're pretty happy with that so that i mean that's interesting um how important would you well no do you always try to use both player traits and the hexad model in your design process or do you try and pick one or the other how important is it to think about both yeah i usually don't use them both together no, usually if i'm working with a game full project i use the hexad and my classification of design elements for gamification and then if i'm creating a complete game then i use the player traits and the classification of game elements for games because everything that i said before that i did for gamification i also did for games in a separate paper but then i pick one of them depending if i'm doing a game for application or if i'm doing a complete game that sounds very sensible sir yeah uh, i've got, actually i've got all my students next week they'll take both surveys the hex ad and the player traits and we'll have mm -hmm. a nice discussion about the differences yeah <laughs> okay that should be interesting yeah now look let's get really up to date can you tell us about hex arcade and your work that was presented at kai play 20 earlier this week oh my god you would need to uh, to have max presenting here <laughs> but uh, i'll try to make it justice okay. um, because most of it what was max's work i just helped a little bit um, so the idea is that you know we want to ask people about their exact user types but just reading questions and answering them it's not very fun is it <laughs> so so max had this idea why don't we uh, create a game where people can play and then from that we can get their user type scores and then that's basically what xrcade is uh, so max designed and implemented two mini games so these are just you play them in a few minutes and depending on what actions you take in the games then we can calculate your user type scores and it's almost as good as using the questions themselves so if you need to know people's user types but you don't want to make them answer <laughs> some questions you want them to have fun while doing that you can use one of the games that's great i mean i think it's good that we yeah. you've gamified the research for the gamification this is great yeah. i know i think maybe we'll have to get max on in a month or so yeah, yeah great <laughs> well let's i'm conscious of the time let's take it on a bit you're going to be talking at gamification europe in a couple of weeks time what can yeah. we look forward to hearing from you i mean I already gave a lot of spoilers for the talk just by talking about <laughs> personalized game for design in this interview. But in that talk, I plan to also bring a, a little about the results that we have. So you don't just believe me when we say that <laughs> the research results were good. I'll also show some of these results and I would uh, show examples of how I implemented and how other people as well have implemented these ideas of personalizing design and I talked about personalizing the game elements here but mm -hmm. there are other things that you can personalize as well like the challenge level the type of activities that people do so so I talk about personalizing the game elements but also personalizing other aspects of the experience that's cool and, and I get the feeling that it'll give us some practical ways to do it at a, a low cost as well if you design yeah. it right yeah. yeah all right so look, I know you're continuing to research as well as work on practical projects. So what sort of research are you doing going forward? So now I have been working on personalized game for design uh, still by just trying to apply the same idea to other application types as well and continue checking the results. And uh, I want to explore my classification of game elements more as well. So I've been collecting more data um, to verify if the classification holds just the same when we have more, more diverse people answering the questions. So for now, what I'm doing is I'm 
following up on what I did so far and trying to collect more data to verify the initial uh, results because you know to have more confidence in the results you have to test several times in different contexts and see that the results match you can just test one time and and say okay uh, so that's what I'm doing I think that's fantastic um but if you're busy doing that what other research do you think is still needed to be done in gamification that's a very good question eh? <laughs> thank you so yeah <laughs> um, so you know one type of research that uh, would be very interesting uh, people have starting to uh, have started to do it but we still have to do it a lot is to better understand the fine mechanisms of how things work like we know that we put uh, just to cite an example we know that we can put badges into an application and it somehow makes it more engaging but exactly how does that work what people feel differently when they are interacting with badges so there was a research team that did some research about that and they figured out that if I remember correctly uh, the users had nine different ways uh, in which they uh, perceived that badges meant something so so different people mm -hmm. uh, perceived those badges in different ways right so so they categorized that in nine different ways so you see even something simple as badges that have been using for every application uh, the way that they work for everybody is not the same and some people have done that with leaderboards as well so I think that is uh, really a type of research that needs more we still have dozens of other types of elements to investigate and we yeah. need to better understand exactly how these elements work when someone interact with them and it seems that each element can work in many different ways for different people so basically there's there's hundreds of different game elements we can use we need to dive deeper into research into all of them and then of course how they interact with each other as well and change change things well that should keep us all busy for a while yep yeah, now look <laughs> i have used my favorite questions so i'm going to go to the q a and i can see there's already a question from antonios he asks, can you highlight any parallels we should be aware of between player types like Hexad and other personality typologies like MBTI or Big Five? Um, or does it even matter? Yeah. That's a good question. And we always try to find these relationships in, in our re research. And we always see some relationships between them but in the end i don't think it matters too much uh, for the purposes of designing game for applications i'm sure it might be very interesting for researchers trying to figure out exactly what leads to what um, you know personality is a fundamental characteristic of a person and the gamification user types is more a result of that, I would say. It's more how they interact with other applications as a result of their personality. But you don't see a one-to-one -one relationship between user types and personality. So I'm sure that someone's personality is one of the factors that influence how they like to play games and use game for applications, but it's not the only one. We could not find an explanation of the user types just based on their personality. Uh, so I'm sure scientists can find it very interesting to try to keep investigating this more and trying to figure out exactly what makes someone have these specific user types. <clears throat> but when you're designing, that doesn't matter too much. When you're designing, you need to have some practical guidelines about how to match people with uh, the kind of things that they like to do. And to do that, I think that <clears throat> the user types have been shown to be more effective. Um, as I said before, to me particularly, my classification of game elements are even more interesting when you just want to select elements. But but for the design for understanding that different people will like to do different types of things. Uh, and Andre suggests using 
the user types as design lenses to think about the kind of things that people are going to be doing to design. And I think that's very useful when you just need user types for that. Uh, if you try to bring personality traits um, as well, it doesn't help very much. But I know that other people have uh, got the opposite route and have been designing uh, based on personality alone. Uh, so the work of uh, Monica and Jonathan and, and their book mm -hmm. Uh, goes in that direction, just using personality to design. So that's a different way. I can't say which one is better. Personally, I prefer the approach with user types. <laughs> I've been using it uh, for uh, long, but I don't have scientific data to tell you that user types are better than personality in this way. Oh, that's all right. I think what what, it, what your answers come down to is it's more of a practical tool. And I think yeah. a lot of what we do in gamification is about practically applying these theories so that we can actually use them easily or more easily. Um, and uh, there's plenty of room for research on the, on the personality side, but we can just get on with our design using the more practical approach. All right. Yep. I like that. Um, oh, we've run out of time. This always happens to me in an interview with someone who's really <laughs> interested in gamification. So what I'd love to do is thank you, Gustavo, for being so open and informative with your answers um, and for answering the questions from the audience. And, uh, well, let's just remind people how it would be best to get in touch with you. Email, LinkedIn, Twitter, your personal website, the company website. What do you prefer? So, sure, you can fill the form on my personal website. You can contact me on Twitter if you wish. I'll put my email address in the chat as well if you want to send me an email directly. I'd be happy That's to hear from nice. you. Okay. I'm going to stop the interview recording now.